the top rugby competitions around the world this one's actually a viewer request i thought we'll have a look now i'm only talking about uh, club competitions or franchise competitions rather than international so we're not looking at world cup six nations rugby championship that kind of thing uh we're just looking at competitions around the world uh where guys are essentially doing that as their day job they're getting paid to play rugby so i'll go over some of the top rugby competitions around the world very briefly on how they work how do they kind of tie in together and um yeah you guys might learn something if you're a rugby buff this is probably already kind of stuff you know but if you're new to the game uh, it might give you a few insights into uh, some of the stuff you've been seeing um, just a quick word i'm going to use some stats in the video for the different leagues that i mention uh, all of the stats that I'm mentioning are from the previous season, which as I record this is the 2019 season for those competitions which span the finish of one year and the start of the other. It'll be the 2018-2019 season. So here we go. We will start with the, the Premiership. At the moment it's the Gallagher Premiership over in, uh, in the UK. So when I say the UK, I mean specifically England. So it's a 12-team competition in England. Uh, which is the top flight of rugby in England. Basically, it's an interesting one because 12 teams is a lot for one country to have in terms of that professional level. Most of the other countries don't have anywhere near that kind of uh, number of professional teams, except maybe France, maybe Japan as well. But uh, at least uh, here in New Zealand, I guess if you include the, 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 the second tier level, there's actually quite a few, but at the top tier... There's certainly not that many. Uh, so like I mentioned, 12 teams in England. Uh, it's a pretty simple format. They play, you play every other team twice, home and away. So once at home, once away. The top four teams qualify for the semi-finals. And the two semi-final winners play in the final. The, the final is at Twickenham, which is England's national stadium. It's their big stadium. So it's a centerpiece event. It's a big crowd event. And uh, the bottom team gets relegated to the division below. So that means there's pretty big incentive in not finishing last. The one thing I do like about that is it makes the bottom of the table actually have some meaning. Like there are other competitions where there's no relegation. And around about halfway through the season, you already realize nothing's happening. Your team's not going to make the playoffs and they're not going to get relegated because that doesn't exist. So they're just going through the motions. But um yeah, there are some who would criticize it saying it makes teams play more cautiously because they don't want to get relegated. They would rather uh, play not to lose than play to win. But anyway, that is what it is. So the bottom team gets relegated and the top team from the championship, which is the second division, ironically, um, they come up the following year. Uh, for last year, the average attendance in premiership games was around 14 and a half thousand. So a decent number of fans. Average number of tries per game was 5.6. So it's, again, a decent amount. Um, in terms of wider Europe, because there's another competition, which I will get to, which runs uh, also during the Premiership season, which is called the, the Champions Cup, which is supposed to be the best of the best competition. So the top six teams from the Premiership qualify for that European competition. So there's also an incentive to finish in the top half of the table. To make things a little bit more complicated, they do have a domestic cup, uh, which runs during the season as well, but uh, it seems to be only held when the international's on. I should mention, I'm a super rugby guy, so I learned a couple of things uh, when I was doing the research for this video as well. Uh, the domestic rugby cup, but it seems to be mainly held when the internationals are on, so the top players are away doing the, the Six Nations or some kind of test tour, uh, so they play a uh, cup competition, which is a knockout. So that goes during the season as well, so potentially all three... Um, well, all teams have three three trophies they could be playing for in any one given season. In terms of most recent winners, there's not a whole lot of variety in the last five years. Uh, of the last five years, Saracens won four titles. Uh oh, my daughter has woken up. Bear with me a second. All right, where was I? Last five years, Saracens have won it four times, and Exeter Chiefs have won it one time. So there's not been a whole lot of variety in terms of your winners. However, recent developments this year have meant that um, 
Saracens will be relegated at the end of this current season uh, as it stands because they uh, they spent too much money. Um, there's a, a salary cap and they breached it. So they'll be getting relegated. So does that mean there's going to be a shakeup in terms of we'll see some new teams winning it? Does that mean there'll just be an extended period where Exeter is dominant? Uh, either way, uh, it should be an interesting period. So yeah, that's the Premiership in a nutshell. Uh, the next one is also in Europe. It's the top 14. Uh, that's the French competition. So again, it's um, not that many countries have, have that many top level teams, but France is one of them. Uh, same deal. It's a pretty simple format. Uh, they play each other once home and once away. So everybody sees everybody twice. Uh, the top six teams qualify for the playoffs in France. Uh, but I guess a slight complication is that the top two teams get the first playoff round off. They get a rest. Whereas the, the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth place teams, they play each other. And then a week later, the winners of that game play the first and second qualifiers. So... Uh, the advantage of becoming the top or second qualifier is that you, you get a break. So you go into the, the first knockout game for you well rested, whereas the other teams have just had to go through a grueling uh, knockout game. So same deal as England. The finals played in the same location every year. It's the start of France, so it's a big centerpiece final. Um, and yeah, it's, um, it's an event. The bottom team gets relegated, same as the Premiership. However, again, it's a slight complication. The 13th place team, so the second bottom team, has to have a, uh, a playoff game against the runner-up in the second division. So the, the, the bottom team from the top division and the, the top team from the second division, they swap. And then the, the two next place teams have their own little playoff to see if they swap places or not. So if the team in 13th manages to win that game, they don't get relegated. But if they lose then they do. So finicky rules like that can make it a little bit harder for fans to get into, but uh, it's not too, too challenging. Um, again, the top six teams qualify for the Champions Cup, so there's an incentive to finish towards the top of the table, uh, aside from not getting relegated. Uh, attendance is pretty similar, average of 14,500 14 fans per game. Uh, average of 5.1 tries a game is slightly lower. The last five winners, though, is definitely a lot more variety. So perhaps if you're looking for a more even competition, the top 14 is the way to go because the last five winners, Toulouse, Cast, Clermont, Racing 92, and uh, Stade Francais. So five years, five different winners. There's no real dominance of any one particular team, at least in the last five years anyway. So, yeah. The other main European competition is the Pro 14 or the Guinness Pro 14, if you want to add the sponsor in there. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated because it's an inter-European competition. It's not just limited to one country. So you got four teams from Wales, four teams from Ireland, uh, two teams from Scotland, two teams from Italy, and more recently, two teams from South Africa. The competition used to be the Pro 12. They added two South African teams to become the Pro 14. So essentially, it's kind of an intercontinental competition as well. It used to just be inter-country in Europe, but now it's intercontinental. Uh, the time zone thing is not really a factor because they're all essentially in a similar-ish time zone. Uh, but the season thing is a factor because obviously when it's uh, when it's summer down in the Southern Hemisphere for the South African teams, it's winter and rugby season uh, up in the Northern Hemisphere uh, countries. So, yeah. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated in its format in that it has two conferences, Conference A and Conference B. Uh, each has half the teams and they divide it kind of by countries of two Irish teams, two Irish teams, two Welsh teams, two Welsh teams. So it's, a, it's supposed to be a pretty even split. Uh, you play your teams in your own conference more. If you followed any other sport, like most of the American sports seem to have conferences, so you'll kind of be familiar with that concept of that you play the teams in your own conference the most, and you should play the other teams as well. Uh, so the same deal here with the Pro 14, except they do ensure that those derby matches where like the, the Irish teams play the Irish teams, even if they're in different conferences, that, that's still kept up. So they do have derby rounds as well because it's also good for the for the fans and for the broadcasters because uh, there's always more interest in derby games just because there is a bit more uh, on the line in terms of local pride. Uh, the conference winners uh, similarly go straight to uh, the semifinals, whereas the, uh, the second and third team in each conference have to 
have to play in an initial quarterfinal to then go on and play the conference winner. So similar to the Pro 14, that is the Pro 14, similar to the Top 14, it's uh, similar names, huh? Uh, yeah, if, if, you, if you the top guy, then you get a week off, which is seen as a benefit. And generally in rugby, one week off is good. Too many weeks off is not, but one week off is, is pretty fine. Um, interestingly, a difference maker between this one, another difference between it and the uh, the English and French leagues is that the final is at a different venue every year. However, it is predetermined at the start of the season. This is the place that's going to host the final. So if you're like trying to make travel arrangements or you plan to go to the final, you can do that in advance. Um, and it's always going to be a big ground because it's a final, right? So yeah, there's no, there's no chance of it being held at a, a small ground. Another difference is there's no there's no relegation from the Pro 14. Uh, similar that the top three teams from each conference qualify for the Champions Cup. So that's your six teams. Plus, because it has to be seven, uh, there's going to be one from, from remember Conference A, Conference B. Those guys are going to play off for, uh, for another spot. So just to make it a slight little bit extra complication as well. But again... It's, it's preferable to get to the Champions Cup. Big caveat with that, though, is it is the European Rugby Champions Cup. So those teams which aren't in Europe, the two South African teams, they don't get to qualify. So even if they were to win the Pro 14, they wouldn't qualify for the Champions Cup, which is, again, just a, a perhaps a slight barrier for fans, but hopefully not too much. Average attendance is a bit lower with just over 8,000 fans a game, but... From what I've seen of it, there's great variation. Some of the uh, the big clubs get a lot more than that, whereas the Italian clubs, I think, for example, and the South African teams generally get get pretty low numbers, so they'd be lucky to get 8,000 a game. Uh, tries per game is up, though. It's 5.8 per game, so perhaps that's also part of it not having relegation, that there's, um, there's less wanting to not lose and more wanting to just play and win. Um... Last five years, you've had two titles for Leinster, one for Scarlets, one for Connacht, and one for Glasgow. So again, it's a bit of a mixed bag, which is nice. Although three of those Scarlets, Connacht, and Glasgow were when it was the Pro, uh, when it was the Pro 12. Um, but yeah, that's the Pro 14. So like I said, it's a little bit more complicated, and then it's multi-country. And uh, since they have the South African team, it's a little bit more complicated again. But that's how that goes. Now, that one tournament that I was talking about that those three previous tournaments mentioned, the European Champions Cup, I'm not going to mention the Challenge Cup because that's like a secondary tournament, uh, but the, the Champions Cup is the the, concert, the, the the competition which has teams from those three leagues. So it's got teams from the Pro 14, it's got teams from France, and it's got teams from England all playing together. So those questions you might have, oh man, is, is Leinster... Better than Racing 92. You get to find out because the teams are going to play each other. So it's the best of the best from those leagues. Minus the South African teams. Uh, not that they would have qualified recently. But yes, those guys um, play in the Champions Cup. So it's a big trophy. It's a, it's, a, it's a good one to win because there's a lot of prestige that goes along with that. You, you can't win that one easily. Uh, the format of it, if you've ever followed the Champions Cup in football, it's pretty, Champions League in football, it's pretty similar to that. Um, but there's 20 teams. Remember, it was six from Premiership, six from France, seven from the Pro 14, and there's one other spot that gets allocated based on a list of factors that I'm not going to go over here. But there's 20 teams. They divide them into five pools. So essentially, all the pool winners go through, and then the three runners up. So there's like little mini competitions uh, within each other, and then there's a knockout stage, which is kind of like a World Cup. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the fact that it's like every pool winner and the best three runners up is a slight complication. Not every runner up gets to go through. It's not that intuitive, but it still kind of works. Um, the higher qualifiers get to host their quarterfinals. And then if they, if they win those, they get to host the semifinal as well. So quarterfinals go on to semifinals. The final is at a predetermined venue. It is also, um, changing every year. But uh, again, you, you do know where it's going to be uh, beforehand. So average attendance for 15,200, so slightly up on all the other competitions, which makes sense. It's the best of the best, so it should have pretty high prestige. Uh, average 5.6 tries per game. 
Interesting, though, last five wins, Saracens three, Leinster one, and Toulon one. Um, Saracens ones will be a bit under the spotlight with them getting relegated, but hey. So, um, yeah, it, it kind of works like a World Cup in that they, or like other cups, they don't let uh, teams from all one place be in the same pool. Like, if you're watching a World Cup, they don't let all the European teams, like in football, play all in the same pool. So, yes, it's a mini pool comp and then knockout stages. So, it's okay. Not the most intuitive, but... Um, it still works. And the last one I'll go over in any kind of detail is uh, the, the, the one and main uh, Southern Hemisphere competition, which is Super Rugby. Uh, now, it's a bit different with the Southern Hemisphere teams in that they don't have relegation as well. Um, or like New Zealand, Australia, and uh, South Africa all have a secondary tier competition, but it doesn't directly correlate with the Super Rugby so it's not like one of the Super Rugby teams would get relegated down to the Mitre 10 Cup, which is our secondary uh, competition. They're kind of like feeder clubs, which uh, feed the Super Rugby team. So Super Rugby's got New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Argentina, and Japan, although Japan is soon to be gone because their one and only team is getting the cut after the 2020 season. So five teams from New Zealand, four from Australia, four from South Africa, one from Argentina and, like I said, currently one from Japan. Um, there used to be two more South African teams. Remember how I mentioned the Pro 14 added two teams? Those were the two teams which got cut from Super Rugby. So Super Rugby kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger and then got too big. So they, they reduced it down and uh, cut it to, to the current size and it's going to be cut by one more team, which is the Japanese team shortly. So it'll be back to 14 teams. But right now it's 15 uh, it is intercontinental, like I said, of all those different countries. They're all in different time zones. The time zones do make it a bit of a, a problem. It's hard for New Zealanders to watch games in South Africa because they're on at like 2 in the morning. Uh, and, you know, it works all the other ways around as well. So it's difficult for everyone else to watch each other's games to a degree. And I would say there's a bit of a disconnect in the interest levels about the other games from the other... Uh, teams like New Zealand fans are perhaps not that fussed about two Australian teams playing each other. Two South African fans may not be that interested in, in you know, two New Zealand teams playing each other, but they're more interested in two South African teams. That's just kind of normal. So, yeah, that is a factor with Super Rugby. It currently has the conference system, but uh, the conference is geographic. So there's a New Zealand conference, an Australian conference, and a South African conference. The Argentinian team is in with the South Africans. And the Japanese team is in with the Australians and five New Zealand teams are together. Uh, but that'll be scrapped once the Japanese team's gone. It'll just be a round robin where everybody plays each other at least once. So uh, the current model sees more of those derby matches, derby matches. But they're going to be uh, back to a round robin as of uh, 2021. No relegation in Super Rugby does make the bottom of the table a bit boring. Like I mentioned earlier, if your team loses too many games, you realize you can't make the playoffs. The end of the season does get a bit dry, so attendances kind of dry up. But, um, yeah, there's nowhere for those teams to go at the second division. Uh, the top teams from each, each conference at the moment do qualify for the playoffs, plus the fourth best team. This is one of the areas that Super Rugby struggles with, is again the... The format is not that clear, like the fourth best team could technically have more points than one of the conference winners from another conference, but they would still finish below them. So uh, those teams all get home quarterfinals, the winners play the semifinals, and then the two semifinalist winners play uh, in the final. The one unique factor, I guess, about Super Rugby is that the top qualifying finalist hosts the final. So there's a big incentive to, to finish the, the season with as many points as possible because if you can make your way through the playoffs, then you will have a home final. So that's a big advantage and most of the Super Rugby winners in the past have been teams who've had that home final. There's a few times when it's gone the other way around, but it also means that it's kind of hard to plan for because you've only got a week's notice as to the venue and time and whatnot for the final. So um yeah that's that's kind of one of the drawbacks uh attendance figures in super rugby are generally not announced from time to time they will be but most of the games are not announced uh i think because the numbers have been down in recent years uh generally anything below ten thousand fans would be seen as low 
And uh, if it gets to 20, that's pretty high. And that's usually in South Africa because they've got bigger crowds. Uh, one thing Super Rugby does suffer from is most of the teams play in stadiums which are rather large. So like my local team, the, the Blues, that's the Auckland Blues rather than the Cardiff Blues, they play in a, like a stadium which seats like 40,000 plus people and they might get 12 or 15,000 to a game. And it looks pretty poor on TV because it's a big stadium. Whereas if it was a 12,000 seater stadium, it'd be full and it'd look great. But it's not. So it does have pretty bad perceptions about its attendance. Uh, but the attendances, I would say, are probably similar to the premiership into the top 14. From those that get announced, it's generally between 10 and 15,000. <clears> When the, one of the Australian teams was dipping below 10 last year, that made the news. Like, oh, that's 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 pretty bad for that team. Uh, average tries per game is 6.35, so that's the highest. That has a reputation for being kind of defense is optional, and uh, that kind of rings true here. Uh, it does have a little bit of an issue with um, with the variety and winners. Like the last five winners, you got the Crusaders three times, the Hurricanes once, and the Highlanders once. All New Zealand teams, so it does struggle a little bit for that variety. So you wouldn't be surprised if South African, Australian, maybe other other viewers start to kind of check out seeing uh, similar results year after year. But anyway, so that's Super Rugby uh, pretty much in a nutshell. That's how it works, but might have to do a video on the format of that next year once that's all changed. Uh, I will do a quick special mention to two other leagues uh, which are the kind of main other places that professional rugby players go. There are others, in, um, undoubtedly, but I'll just quickly mention these ones. The top league in Japan, I think traditionally it used to be a place where people would go to retire. Uh, the general perception being that the rugby in Japan is a little bit less hard-hitting. You can earn some pretty good money. The season's not too long. But I think more and more guys are going there in the peak of their career. So the league standard is definitely on the rise. Uh, especially after the Rugby World Cup, which was in Japan in 2019. 16 teams, it's got a big corporate influence on the teams. The teams usually seem to have some kind of corporate and then team name, so like the Coca-Cola something or, you know, whatever like that. So uh, that's that's a big difference from some of the other competitions. Average attendance for last year was 6,000, just around, just under 6,000. But I would say after the Rugby World Cup, that'll get a big boost because Japan did really well in that World Cup. So it definitely seems like a league on the up where a lot of star players are now heading. The other one is Major League Rugby. It's a relatively young competition. It's in America. It's only played two seasons. The 2020 season will be its third. Uh, but it seems to be growing. Uh, the 2018 season had seven teams. The 2019 season had nine teams. And... Um, there's going to be uh, 12 in the 2020 season. So 11 American and one Canadian team. Uh, attendance was just over 2,000 in the 2019 season. So still pretty low. But again, I think it's a growing game. And there have been some big name signings for, uh, for that league uh, in recent times as well. So it's definitely one that's growing. So yeah, that's a pretty quick introduction. Oh, 23 minutes. Not all that quick. Um, relatively brief. Uh, just about some of these leagues around the world. There's no doubt one or two that you've probably usually got your eyes on. Um, but yeah, it's always, uh, I guess, good to get a bit of a feeling for some of the other competitions as well. Um, if you're new to the game of rugby, this might give you an idea of which competition you would like to, to follow. Uh, the ones that I've mentioned is usually relatively easy to get um, get access to. I think most of them are usually on some kind of paper per view network uh top league and mlr might be a little harder to get your hands on because they're not quite as established but those other ones uh generally have pretty broad big broadcasting deals so you should be able to find your way uh, to view those games one way or another but yeah like i said i'm, I'm from new zealand so super rugby is generally uh, the competition i know the most amount about uh any mistakes uh that are made in the research do let me know down in the comments any other things you'd like to add uh, do let me know as well, but, um, yeah, that's it for me guys. Hopefully that was informative and, um, yeah, I'll talk to you again soon. See you later.